for the hardest hitting show in talk radio. The true progressive voice since 2012. This is South Pause. And welcome to South Paws on the Pacifica Radio Network. We are the leaders of the revolution. My name is Darren Gibson, and I am your co-host. My name is Jack Prince, your fellow co-host. Well, Jack, we've got quite a bit to talk about today, and we'll get to it in just a minute. But before we get started, a couple of reminders. You can follow us on social media by going to facebook.com forward slash South Paws Radio Show. You can follow us at Twitter at South Paws Radio. You can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com forward slash South Paws Radio. You can listen to the show anytime you like at Spreaker.com. Do a search for South Paws there. We're on the iTunes store. Do a search under podcast for South Paws. Once you've found our logo, you found us. Links to our podcast are sent to our Facebook and Twitter accounts. They're also sent to our YouTube channel. Do a search for South Paws Radio at YouTube.com. And, of course, we're on great Pacifica stations, including KCEIFM Taos, New Mexico, KZGM Kabul, Missouri, and Global Community Radio Channel 1. We're on every Saturday night at 11 p.m., so make sure you check us out there as well. Yeah, let's get to the big news, at least in our world. Bernie Sanders has decided to suspend his campaign for the time being. He said he's going to continue collecting delegates, but that he's basically going to focus on what's going on in the Senate with the coronavirus and everything that's been going on in this country, and for that matter, around the world. Yeah, again, doing something uh, helpful and uh, not seeking his own self aggrandizement Yeah, people still have this hope that maybe the delegates are going to mount enough in his favor to swing tight by August, but uh, no. Uh, the theory is that it's going to grant him leverage. My heartfelt realization is is that we're not going to see crowds ever again filled with progressives cheering a non-adulterated progressive voice like we have for the last few months, or for that matter, since 2016. I'm th- sorry. I think I, you're right about I, that. I think that, and I have a, a short paragraph that I wrote in regards to that loss. It goes like this. In 1959, we lost Buddy Holly, Richie Vallon, and the big bopper Richardson in Iowa. The event eventually became known as the day the music died, thanks to Don McLean's classic 1971 song, American Pie. In April 2020, the music died again, and it wasn't on April Fool's Day. The music was the sound of an honest politician singing the beautiful chords of equality, fairness, and justice. It had been so long and so unique. It's been so comforting without parallel on the political scene. It will not be sung so clearly again. It may never be on a candidate's lips again. No voice will challenge the corporate masters genuinely again. No voice will prescribe the real answers to our dilemma and be brave enough to place a stick in the roaring, lying mouth of the venal corporate politicians that will rule unchallenged. I fear we will never see crowds of thousands across the country cheering the unadulterated progressive voice of another Bernie Sanders. You had the tonic right next to your deathbed, America, and you spit it out. Yep. I agree with you 100% there. Yeah, sadly, it's true. Yeah. Now, there's a story. This came from Vocal Media. This is written by Colton Tanner Casados Medva. This was written on Wednesday, April 8th. This is basically his take on things. This is an opinion piece here. It says, when I woke up to the news that Vermont Senator and progressive champion Bernie Sanders was suspending his campaign, I felt an all-too-familiar feeling creeping back up. Despair coupled with an angry, rage-inducing political cynicism that nothing in America will change, that business as usual will continue on, and that America's one and only people-powered movement had finally been sacrificed on the altar of corporate greed and establishment do-nothingness. 
Joe Biden has given me no reason to feel any other way. Furthermore, exactly. he has given millions of progressives no reason to believe otherwise. <laughs> he has staunchly resisted Medicare for all, even though the circumstances have never made it clear that it's exactly what America needs right now. This movement in American history is unprecedented. The COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic is sweeping the globe, and America's ailing health care system finds itself under the media spotlight. Millions have filed for unemployment, signaling the start of what Bernie Sanders believes to be one of the worst economic recessions in modern history. Now, I'm going to stop there for a minute. As a matter of fact, some economists are saying this is going to be worse than the Great Depression of 1929. So you just hang yeah, on to your... the least bit hyperbole. Just hang on to your asses, folks. You're going to need to. Yeah. For, for millions, let me continue. For millions worried about health, their health care, their access to affordable education, their small businesses, and the environmental struggle against climate change and corporate greed, the end of the Sanders campaign has felt like a death blow to the future we so desperately hoped we could achieve. As I was being swept away by the currents of despair, Bernie announced during his live stream address to supporters that his name would remain on the ballots in the remaining primary contest so that he could continue to collect delegates in the hopes of pushing the party platform further to the left during their delayed August convention. He seemed enthusiastic and hopeful that he could still make a change, even as I felt cynical about his odds of influencing a corporate establishment that is opposed to arguably his biggest policy proposal, Medicare for all. We still have yet to see which concessions, if any, the Biden wing of the Democratic Party will be willing to make to progressives. There are a lot of months in between now and August, and the political landscape can change, especially now since mainstream media will come to focus on the Biden versus Trump matchup. As I sat there thinking about the timing of Bernie's suspension with nearly half of the states left to vote, I started to think that perhaps this is shaping up to be the most strategic move the Sanders campaign has ever made. It may seem like, from the outside, the end of his bid for the nomination. But I wonder if Bernie Sanders and his closest campaign advisors see it that way. Here are his words regarding his continued presence in the race taken directly from the email he sent out to supporters. And this is a direct quote. And on a practical note, let me also say this. I will stay on the ballot in all remaining states and continue to gather delegates. While Vice President Biden will be the nominee, we should still work to assemble as many delegates as possible at the Democratic Convention, where we will be able to exert significant influence over the party platform and other functions. And again, that's signed Bernie Sanders. The one thing Bernie has that Biden doesn't is enthusiasm among his supporters, along with a grassroots infrastructure capable of raising awareness around his campaign and the issues it addresses via a millions-large social media following. Where Bernie Sanders suffered the most was in mainstream media, which has disproportionately given his opponents more airtime since the 2016 race, and which overwhelmingly has supported the narrative that he could not win the nomination after Super Tuesday, despite so many states remaining in the contest. He has also been criticized by many within his own movement for not going hard enough against Joe Biden and his policy and character weaknesses against Donald Trump. There are many who would have liked to see him go on the attack regarding Biden's electability. Well, Bernie may have just done that without having to be the one to go on the offensive. There is growing concern among voters that Biden is in an even worse position than Clinton in the general election, as he is a candidate that has a weak record on trade that hurts his chances of winning working-class votes that went to Trump last time around. As far as polls go, around the same time in 2016, Clinton was projected to beat Trump by double digits. Then her lead fell as the election drew nearer, culminating in a disappointing Electoral College defeat, even as she took the popular vote. As for 2020, Biden is barely leading by single digits, and we can expect that gap to shrink to a relatively even heated contest in November. Donald Trump, much like Bernie Sanders, has an enthusiastic support base that will turn out to vote in the general. But to return to Sanders' decision to suspend his campaign, the more I think about it, the smarter a move it seems to be, and the more hopeful I become that he can still make a case for the nomination in August. There are three reasons I'm still optimistic. One, mainstream media will now focus entirely on Biden versus Trump. 
Unlike the silence surrounding Biden's sexual misconduct within traditionally liberal media outlets, right-wing media will not spare Biden on this issue. This will force left-leaning mainstream media outlets to have to defend, investigate, or otherwise cover these very same allegations or else risk allowing America's right media to define the discourse. We can expect a fiasco on par with the Hillary Clinton email gaffe, although regarding a far more serious accusation, sexual assault. This will likely hurt Biden's polling by muddying the waters for independents and nonpartisan voters who don't see much of a difference between Donald Trump and the establishment left. Meanwhile, Bernie will be continuing to collect delegates. Two, by suspending his campaign months before the DNC convenes to select a nominee, Bernie Sanders has put a bullet through the oft-repeated sentiment that he cares more about his ego than defeating Donald Trump. By urging his supporters to continue to vote for him in the remaining primaries, even as he stumps for Joe Biden against Trump and the GOP, Bernie will curry a more favorable media presence that continues to raise awareness about the policies he cares deeply about, such as Medicare for All. By officially placing himself outside of the race for the nomination, Bernie can enjoy a relatively easy media spotlight as a Biden surrogate that will ensure no one is able to claim that Sanders and Sanders alone is obstructing the left's chances of unseating Trump. Meanwhile, Bernie will be continuing to collect delegates. Three, there is always the chance that progressive voter turnout will stay the same or even increase to counter a defeatist attitude in the remaining primaries, whereas Biden's will decrease due to the belief that he has already won the nomination and that there is no further need to cast a ballot. By suspending his bid for the nomination and embracing his role as a party influencer, Bernie has made the contest about ideas, which nonetheless could still secure him the presidential nomination, as meanwhile, Bernie will still be collecting delegates. In one fell swoop, Bernie has removed himself as a target for left-leaning establishment media and placed the entire emphasis on Biden versus Trump, which is sure to expose Biden's weaknesses to give us a clearer image of his prospects in November as both Democratic voters and party insiders will be able to watch and assess his poll numbers between now and the convention. Bernie can still leverage the grassroots coalition that has supported him thus far to encourage voter turnout in the remaining primaries, if not for him, than for his policies and ideas. Either way, there is always the chance that the progressive movement can help Sanders even the delegate score with Biden or overtake him altogether before the convention. Nothing has really changed as far as the race goes. Bernie's supporters can still vote for him in the remaining contest. Well, I'm going to stop there. Here's the problem with that. States are already starting to cancel primaries because of Bernie suspending his campaign. That's a problem. But that's not the only problem. The main problem, the elephant in the room, is that we're forgetting in 2017 the DNC was in court for election fraud. Mm -hmm. And their lawyers and their spokespeople admitted they have no obligation to put forth a candidate that's the people's choice. So I don't care. I mean, I, I listened for 15 minutes to a lot of points that I agreed with, well written. And it does bring a little breath of promise or hope into our lungs, but my lungs have been hit over and over again and lost those breaths since 2016. So I'm not getting too giddy here. My point is, is that the ultimate problem is the DNC will never, will never allow Bernie Sanders to get the nomination. If they have to close the hall down, if they have to close democracy, there's no link they will not go to to impede and stop Sanders' nomination. That's the lesson I think we need to keep always in front of us. I hear people saying, oh, this time it was closed, or we worked so hard. Ha uh ha. -uh. You, I say you, I'm not talking you personally. I'm talking those dedicated, Bernie, honest, hardworking people. You were fighting against an insurmountable, unmovable oligarch, neoliberal formation called the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And until you realize there will never be any room in the end for Bernie's candidacy, you're just wasting effort. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I have lost all confidence in any, any gratuity in the Democratic Party towards real progressivism. They'd rather have Trump win than put forth a progressive as 
the candidate. It's that sad. It, you know, and that's the truth. Go ahead. It is the truth. It really. Did you see the uh, little meme where they have a leash on the little dog? The guy saying, uh, you know, it's got a sign on him. He's uh, vote blue no matter who. And then the DNC. Yeah, has the, the, yeah. The one uh, you posted last night or uh, Thursday night on our Facebook page. You folks really need to check this out. I was laughing so hard I almost pissed myself. Uh, here's here's something that is sarcastic. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, I'm sure the establishment knows best. Uh, us Bernie brothers, us Bernie brothers, twenty twenty are just cultists. Bernie Bros, like the Trump base. Yeah, <laughs> Joe will be the savior, just as Hillary was. We need just to allow them that Hillary and Joe are both corporatist whores. It's okay pitting a special needs kid up against the school bully. What could go wrong? <laughs> Remember, Hillary lost because of us, right, Darren? Mm -hmm. Again, I repeat, Hillary lost because of us. The ever-increasing disparity between the 1% and the people is just a new normal. Yeah. Bernie promising the moon, he's gone. That's done. Hell, even JFK didn't do that. No, wait a second. JFK did do that. Get it straight. You're choosing to sideline the energy, enthusiasm, and integrity for a meaningful change. But by God, remember this. It's not going to be on us when your losers lose again. It will be because they're losers, and the people have had their corporatist number for a while now. Mm -hmm. You know, what happened? Republicans always liked corporate candidates. There was a time when Democrats didn't. What happened, you people, setting the bar so low? And I read all that to say this, according to Orwell. The people that elect corrupt politicians, imposters, thieves, and traitors are not victims, but accomplices. George Orwell. That's exactly right. Complacency is compliancy. Yeah, well said. That, that's true. They so, are accomplices to mm -hmm. what they got. Yep. Not it's, victims. It's, to what they will get come it's, November. It's Stockholm Syndrome, Jack. That's just exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. The reason that the Democratic Party never wants progressive movements is because that's what their owners want. Do I need to play Carlin? Do I really need to play the Carlin again? I think we should. Yep. Here we go, folks. George Carlin on who owns this country. There's a reason. There's a reason for this. There's a reason education sucks. And it's the same reason that it will never, ever, ever be fixed. It's never going to get any better. Don't look for it. Be happy with what you got. Because the owners of this country don't want that. I'm talking about the real owners now. The real owners, the big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. The politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They own all the important land. They own and control the corporations. They've long since bought and paid for the Senate, the Congress, the state houses, the city halls. They got the judges in their back pockets. And they own all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They got you by the balls. They, they spend billions of dollars every year lobbying, lobbying to get what they want. Well, we know what they want. They want more for themselves and less for everybody else. But I'll tell you what they don't want. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. That's against their interest. That's right. They don't want people who are smart enough to sit around the kitchen table and figure out how badly they're getting f***ed by a system that threw them overboard 30 f***ing years ago. They don't want that. You know what they want? They want obedient workers. Obedient workers. People who are just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork and just dumb enough to passively accept all these increasingly shittier jobs with the lower pay, the longer hours, the reduced benefits, the end of overtime, and the vanishing pension that disappears the minute you go to collect it. And now they're coming for your social security money. They want your f***ing retirement money. They want it back so they can give it to their criminal friends on Wall Street. And you know something? They'll get it. They'll get it all from you sooner or later because they own this f***ing place. It's a big club, and you ain't in it.
You and I are not in the big club. By the way, it's the same big club they used to beat you over the head with all day long when they tell you what to believe. All day long, beating you over the head in their media, telling you what to believe, what to think, and what to buy. The table is tilted, folks. The game is rigged. And nobody seems to notice. Nobody seems to care. Good, honest, hard-working people, white collar, blue collar, doesn't matter what color shirt you have on. Good, honest, hard-working people continue, these are people of modest means, continue to elect these rich suckers who don't give a about them. They don't give a about you. They don't give a about you. They don't care about you at all, at all, at all. Yeah, you know? And nobody seems to notice, nobody seems to care. That's what the owners count on, the fact that Americans will probably remain willfully ignorant of the big red, white, and blue d that's being jammed up their assholes every day. Because the owners of this country know the truth. It's called the American dream, because you have to be asleep to believe it. And I suggest anybody who hasn't heard that, you listeners out there, if you have a family member that hasn't heard this George Carlin bit by now, play that for them. Let them think about it. Let them stew on it for a few minutes, for a few hours, for a few days. Put it on, re on loop. Let it repeat. People need to hear this. People need to wake up. Yeah, that's true. And I don't know how you do it because Bernie's out there telling you this stuff. And yeah, yet that, there's and yet there's still people out there that, oh, Bernie's just the worst thing ever. Well, I tell you what, you folks that support Joe Biden, you deserve what you're going to get in November 2020. You heard it here first. You deserve it. Yeah. Yeah, the DNC took Bernie out with uh, an Obama-aided Super Tuesday. I want to make uh, more comments on that. But I repeat, the DNC took Bernie out with an Obama-aided Super Tuesday coup. Yeah. And now a mentally challenged Biden is supposed to beat Trump. What the F? That's delusional. You have to be absolutely delusional. First of all, you have to be totally asleep at the wheel to miss the coup that took place. You have to put a few dots together, the phone calls that came from Obama. Remember the silent Obama who hasn't endorsed anybody. I understand mm -hmm. the political advantage of not committing because you don't want to step on your progressive uh, so-called supporters Obama. But most of them have learned you're a fake anyway when it comes to progressivism. But nonetheless, you held your cards, you held your cards. But then two phone calls took place just just prior to Bernie's resignation or his withdrawal, what, however you want to determine. Yeah. And the phone call probably went something like this. Hey, you know what? You've done a lot. And we're going to uh, adapt some of those policies. But we need to coalesce now. We need to coalesce just like I call for the coalescing on the day where we had all of the Democrats resign from their candidacy. I'm talking about uh, Klobuchar. I'm talking about Little Petey. Mm -hmm. That they then lined up summarily right behind Biden. And then we go down to South Carolina. We get our establishment, Uncle Tom, down there to put the emphasis on for the old black voters in South Carolina. Clyburn. Biden wins that. Yeah. And then... The whole media falls in on top of the American mind and says, you see, this is really the guy. And those that were kind of confused and hear the constant barrage against Bernie, they just said, oh, hell, why not? Let's just fall in line. It was a well-orchestrated establishment coup. And I, I repeat, you got to be totally blind absolutely asleep to have snored your way right through that coup and not realized what happened. Now on the other side of the cloud, we've got, and I'll repeat, a mentally challenged mind who's going to knife fight with Donald Trump, whose greatest growing propensity is a list of sexually, uh, sexual accusations from, from women who has had very little to say about the coronavirus that made any sense and wasn't just a regurgitated issue or policy that Bernie had stated earlier. And this is the horse you think is going to win the race. We'll be there in November, Darren. Yeah. We'll, we'll be there to remind these people of the consequence of you missing the entire bill on this election. You missed it by a mile. I'll be there. I'm right. talking to the American public. 
the the Friday that we record after the election, I'm going to be there with the same four words that I said in 2016. Those four words are, I told you so! I told you so! Yeah, yeah, and, and, and don't give us all your consolation. All these hand-wringing, real nice Biden people all of a sudden. You know what I mean? We don't, we don't need you to consolate. We don't need you to console us. The Biden people, instead, they need to explain how they can win with Biden's cognitive decline, sexual impropriety, history of neoliberalism legislation, his submission to oligarchs that stretches back as far as any American memory. Understanding, that sounds so nice, you understand. Our, our wounds are raw, one of these Biden people. So let's not rub it into the Bernie people. Their wounds are raw right now. That sounds so nice, but by God, you better be able to give us some kind of an explanation of how you think he's going to be Trump for no other reason than the fact that Trump is so bad. That's the only card that Biden can play. We heard about Hillary. Look what that got us. So hold all your crocodile tears. Hold them all because you're going to need them around November 2020. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what that they can also hold off on. They can hold off on this you Bernie supporters need to get in line and support Biden. Oh, voting third party is a vote for Trump. Sitting at home and not voting is a vote for Trump. No, a vote for Trump is a vote for Trump. Like I said in 2016, that is period, end of story. A vote for Trump is a vote for Trump and nothing else is. Do not shame people into voting. I tell you what, Jack... I've already kicked three people off my friends list for vote shaming, including one that's a longtime listener, and I just don't care. You will not vote shame me because I will call you an asshole to your face, and then I am going to kick you out of my life permanently for good forever. Do not start this with me because here's what's going to happen. I'm already, I've already told you off air what I'm planning on this November and I, this is subject to me changing my mind down the road. We'll see what happens. But as of right now, I'm not voting in November. I'm not voting up or down ticket. I'm sitting my fat ass home, and I'm going to stay there. I'm not going to participate in this because why? Because the rich have already proved that elections don't matter because they're going to control it. You want to change things? Get out in the streets and change it. Star marching, folks. Wildcat strikes. General strike. You want to change things? You need to get out there and do something other than going to the polls because the polls don't matter. Yeah, I know, Darren. You remind me of Dean Debs who said, I'd rather vote for something I want and not get it than vote for something I don't want and get it. Exactly. I tell you what else. The only time you're going to get me to the polls until... The rest of this country can change their single binary thinking here. The only time I'll go to the polls is if there's a millage on the poll, and it's going to be an automatic no vote every single goddamn time until the rich start forking over some money. I'm tired of having to pay for everything. I'm tired of paying for the roads, the schools, everything. It's time the rich start kicking in. They're the ones building up all the wealth. They're the ones sitting on the pile of money. You know what I'm sitting on? Jack sh yeah, but Darren, that's going to change. You're going to get a magnanimous check in 25 weeks from now <laughs> for a whopping $1,200 while the corporations and Wall Street were rained upon with not millions, not billions, but trillions of dollars. I find it absolutely a complete mystery how the Wall Street numbers can come out. What? Sixteen, seventeen hundred ahead in the last couple of days, when we have the highest percent of unemployment since the Great Depression, where we got how, how many people applied for unemployment? How many people unemployed? They what right is, now the uh, numbers are at a sixteen million people and counting. And if the, you talk about a ventilation system that saved somebody's life, trillions of dollars have literally saved Wall Street, so that Trump doesn't have to take that on the chin. So while he's rope a with Wall Street being fed intravenously with just created money from the Fed, he thinks we'll just suddenly 
let's, you know, get out of this thing, reopen. And uh, there won't be any bump. As a matter of fact, the stock market may be up higher when we get out of it. And then we'll return to glorious economic success. And in will be in he'll be into his uh, election cycle in uh, uh, August, uh, September. That, that's that's the game plan. But the scoreboard in the sky says, uh-uh. Now, we got 17,000 dead people. You can't hide those. We lead the world with the amount of uh, infestations. But there's a battle. The battle is to ignore the obvious, to keep the economy going with bogus support. It's not based on production. It's not based on employment. And then lie your ass off to the point that people will think you did a, a good job. It's the most sickening display. Honestly, Trump was enough to drive me crazy before. But his daily, daily shows, which I recommend people not even watch, are enough to drive you to Prozac. A lot of the networks have stopped carrying the daily briefings because all he does is lie. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, and people, a lot of people have said, uh, this is the biggest torture. This is almost as bad as uh, feeling the death threat uh, for you and your loved ones to go out to buy your milk. Mm -hmm. It's it's more damaging to your mental well-being just to listen to Trump one more damn day. Exactly. Before yeah. we get into the coronavirus stuff, there's two articles that we're recommending for you folks. The first one is dated April 7th. This written by David Kleon, writing for the Daily Beast. The headline reads, By picking Joe Biden, Democrats are kissing their future goodbye. Yeah. The other one yeah. that we want you to read, Our friends at Socialist Alternative, and we have a lot of people at the Grand Rapids chapter of Socialist Alternative who listen to this show, and we thank you for listening. There's yes, an article do. on their website Go to socialistalternative.org. It's an article written by Aaron Brightwell dated March 25th. The headline reads, Joe Biden, Servant of Wall Street. We really encourage yeah. you to read both of those articles. They're yeah, well that one you're just it. mentioning just is so on target, folks. You you owe it yourself to, to read that. From his coziness with Wall Street and the billionaires to his vote for the Iraq War, they're relentless. They lay it all out there. And you read that and you go, my God, this is our nominee to try and stop Trump. Mm -hmm. Please get to get uh, on the computer and look those two stories up. Yeah, I will eventually post links to those on our official Facebook page. So if you go to Facebook.com forward slash Southpaws Radio Show, you'll find the links to those two stories there. All right, let's get yeah. into some of the coronavirus stuff here at least in the state of Michigan, Governor Gretchen Whitmer has now extended the stay-home order until April 30th. What's going to happen from there, who knows at this point. Uh, but she has extended it. She has made a few modifications for it. Now the big box stores have to control the number of people coming in. They're limiting it. If you have a store that's 50,000 square feet or larger, you can only have four people per thousand square feet in the store. That's a big deal. The other yeah. thing is she is now ordering stores to allow two hours of shopping time, specifically dedicated to the elderly and to people with pre-existing health conditions, including heart disease, diabetes, and other conditions. Mm-hmm. Because I know some of the big box stores have opened an hour early for those folks and allow shopping for an hour. Now this order says they have to give them two hours because people can't get in there. You and I have seen it. I'm immunocompromised. I've got type 2 diabetes. I tried going to one of those shopping events at 7 o'clock in the morning at a Meyer store, and the line out the door was unbelievable. I said, forget mm -hmm. this. I went elsewhere. Yeah. You you stayed in line at your Meyer store. Yeah, I, I did. I haven't gone back. Uh, I, I go to a place uh, fresh time, uh, like 6.30 in the morning, and there's hardly anybody in. You know, they're now saying, though, you need to get that mask on. I don't care what it's made out of. You get a mask around your face or you're going to go to the grocery store. That's probably the most dangerous congregational point that, that we have. It involves everybody. I mean, everybody goes yep. to the grocery store, the old and everybody else. Yep, and I, I'm going to tell you something. They, they keep saying that, oh, yeah, you just wear 
a mask. It doesn't have to be a surgical mask. It can be a cloth mask. It can be whatever. Really. <laughs> Let me fill you in, folks. Let's throw some science at this statement. How big is the typical coronavirus cell? Three, three tenths Smaller of a micron? A it's, it's very small. It's minute. <laughs> you know what stops those viruses from getting through? An N95 mask, a surgical mask. That's it. That's all. Cloth mask ain't going to do anything for it. I'm sorry. There's a video. I believe it's out of Italy. The guy had several different masks, a cloth, carbon mask, and all you got to do is take an aerosol spray can and spray it on the inside of the mask and watch the particles go out the front. But then yeah. he gets a surgical yeah. mask, no particles, N95 mask, no particles. There but you go, folks. You're being lulled into people. a false sense of security by saying, oh, you can just wear a cloth mask. No, get you an N95 mask. Do whatever it takes, get yeah. an N95. Get the best one to go and get a mask. Yes. They're talking about the fact that, you know, a mask on your face will keep you from, from touching your face. So I don't normally touch my face that much. Uh, <laughs> You'll be surprised. But... <laughs> Nonetheless, here's the biggest safeguard. Seriously, it's spacing. If you look at the highest concentrations of this outbreak, you look at the Mardi Gras and the results down in New Orleans, you look at just the natural proximity in New York City. I mean, you know, just on a, on a work day or, I mean, just to, uh, the, the coagulation of people. You look at, well, any city, Philadelphia now, you know, the spacing of people is the number one uh, safeguard. In light of that, we have still churches following. They're going to gather people on the 12th. They're going to disregard the warnings, the dictates, the mandates, and they're going to bring people and sit them a foot apart. Yes. It's, it's unconscionable. Yes. You've sent, you, you've sent me the story. I'm going to read it here real quick. This is Rich McKay writing for Reuters. A handful of holdout U.S. churches plan to hold in-person services on Easter Sunday, saying their right to worship in person outweighs public health officials' warnings against holding large gatherings during the coronavirus outbreak. <clears throat> Most U.S. churches are expected to be closed on Sunday, and a broad majority of observant Americans are expected to follow authorities' recommendations to avoid crowds to limit the spread of the potentially lethal COVID-19 respiratory disease caused by the new coronavirus but not all of them. 42-year-old Reverend Tony Spell, pastor of the Evangelical Life Tabernacle Church near Baton Rouge, Louisiana, said, quote, Satan and a virus will not stop us, end of quote. He expects a crowd of more than 2,000 to gather in worship at his megachurch on Sunday. In an interview, he said, quote, God will shield us from all harm and sickness. We are not afraid. We are called by God to stand against the Antichrist creeping into America's borders. We will spread the gospel. End of quote. No. Unbelievable. No. Here's, here's what Louisiana officials need to do. Get about 300 cops out there. Block the driveway going into the church. And you start going in. Immediate arrest. Do not pass go. Yep. Do not collect $200. You want to congregate and collect this, you'll do it in jail. Yep. Hey, we got a National Guard, right? National Guard, guard the nation. Guard the nation, National Guard. Get mm -hmm. it? These people are a danger to the nation. These yes. people you need to put in your trucks, drive down to the jail, and let them use their prison ministry skills, right? They like to be gathered together, right? Dearly beloved, let us gather together. Gather together with prisoners. That's really close proximity. Mm -hmm. And you bring your message to them while you're in a hotbed, a cauldron of coronavirus. Yeah. You got faith? Good. Take, take it to the prisons. Let's see just how strong that faith is. Yeah. And the National Guard or the police, somebody, needs to crowd these people for our safety. Exactly. Now, most major U.S. religious institutions are holding services online. A lot of the Catholic diocese and Protestant denominations are. Some of them are also broadcasting through radio and TV. But let me continue the story. Indeed, some major religious liberty legal advocacy groups whose mission is to challenge restrictions on freedom of religion have not raised objections to the closures, saying churches have been treated the same as other major institutions and that safety comes first. In Idaho, 
Eamon Bundy. You remember him, folks? The oh, guy yeah, that led sure. the standoff? Yeah. He has led multiple standoffs against authorities and active protest against the federal government. He plans to gather hundreds of people for an Easter observance in defiance of public health advice, according to multiple media reports. Another holdout church, the Evangelical Cross Culture Center in Lodi, California, about 70 miles southwest of San Francisco, plans another service even after its members found their church doors locked against them last week. 43-year-old lay preacher John Duncan, who has led the Evangelical Center for more than 10 years, said that under city orders, his landlord changed the locks and shut them out Sunday morning. Lodi police officers were standing by the door because they were defying both local and state stay-at-home orders and a court order from the San Joaquin County Public Health Services. Yeah. Instead, Duncan... Yeah. Instead, Duncan held brief curbside prayers with his congregants as they showed up for the 11 a.m. service. He said, quote, mm -hmm. It is disappointing because we have a valid lease, but we won't be stopped. God commands us to meet, and that's what we're going to do Easter, end of quote. No, actually, God didn't command you to gather. Read Matthew 6, 5, and 6, 6 in the Bible. He told you to pray in your closet, that if you pray you in public, that you're no better than the false prophets. Serious. If you don't believe me, pick up your Bible, read Matthew 6, 5, and 6, 6. Well, it's an easy target for these uh, evangelicals to look like they're so confident in their God's protection they can gather together. It's real, real easy. But as we saw a woman who died uh, last week who had set the entire uh, band time gathering was uh, unnecessary, that God would protect her. She was really staunch, and uh, she died without any fanfare. And these people do succumb just like anybody else. There is no religious exclusivity. There is no exception. They fall from it just as fast as anybody else. And I guarantee if you gather on Easter, evangelicals, you will see a real cluster of infestations because of it. And when those people are gasping for their last breath, they can't pray. Did anybody see the picture of the doctor in China who died they had it filmed. They're one of the early whistleblowers. Matter of fact, the Chinese authorities tried to hush him up. Yep. They then revered him after he died. But they have on Facebook a picture. His eyes are as big as walnuts because the sensation is you're drowning, but you don't drown quick. You drown for hours. You, your body fights and continues to fight to take one more breath. And so you leaders out there, you church leaders, you men of the cloth, you take a look at that picture, and then you extrapolate that on 15, 20, 30 people out there in your congregation that you have called together. You look at some young people, and you extrapolate that picture of that person dying, and you ask yourself, is it worth the collection plate you're going to count? Uh, on the 12th in the evening, is it worth you looking like a real tough guy for God, like your, uh, your other Savior sits in Washington? Is it worth it, pal, for you to imagine people dying that gruesome death or spraying to other people? If they, if they die, but they also say now one person has a circle of 40, and then that 40 goes to 400, and it just multiplies exponentially, that's going to be on your head, Mr. Evangelical. It's ridiculous, Darren. Yeah, I believe we gave the, st the statistic last week that one person within a 30-day period can infect up to 99,000 people with this stuff. This spreads quickly and easily. One person? Yes. So gather together thousands. This ain't the flu, folks. This ain't the flu. If you had some guys in a barn playing Russian roulette, $100 a roll, right? In other words, bang, it's $100. It didn't go off. You roll the the barrel, however you play Russian roulette. I've never played it. Yeah. And the police came in and said, my God, you're endangering this person's life. You're both going to be arrested for your safety. That's two people. That's two people. And don't tell me the stakes of roulette for death possibilities to gather people together isn't even greater. Mm -hmm. There should be immediate and complete uh, authority of black each to say, you don't gather. You won't gather. You're not going to do it. you got religious beliefs. You believe in talking snakes. Okay, that's fine. 
You can believe that all you want, but you're not going to kill innocent people who don't believe like you do. It's a, that's the whole reason we have a secular government. Exactly. Did you see uh, Graham's, Billy Graham's daughter came out and said, oh, hey, this is just God's way, talking about the virus, to return us back to religious rule and get away from secular government. <laughs> and as we've said many times, yeah, what we really have here is a battle between science, how do I say this, uh, illumination of the truth, and the dark ages. Mm -hmm. Literally. It's smart versus stupid is what it is, Jack. Yeah. I'll just be very blunt. Like you've said before, free, dumb. You're free to be dumb. Until it kills somebody. Yep. This disease doesn't think about religion, race, sex, nope. sexual orientation, rich, poor, doesn't matter. And the proof of that right here. I have this article from Newsweek. This is David Brennan writing April 9th. As many as 150 members of the Saudi Arabian royal family may have been infected with the coronavirus, according to a new report. The infections are supposedly a key element in the Saudi decision to announce a ceasefire in Yemen, where Riyadh has been battling Iran-backed Houthi rebels on behalf of the country's deposed president since 2015. According to the New York Times, as many as 150 Saudi royals are believed to have contracted the virus, including members of the lesser branches of the extensive family. The New York Times cited a person close to the family as giving the information. Newsweek has contacted the Saudi government and its embassy in Washington, D.C. for comment, and I don't believe they've gotten back to them. Saudi Arabia reported its first coronavirus case six weeks ago. Since then, there are now... At least 2,932 confirmed cases in the kingdom, 41 deaths, 631 recoveries. That's according to data from Johns Hopkins University. Among them, according to the Times, is the senior prince and Riyadh governor Faisal bin Bandar bin Abdulaziz Al Saud. The prince, who is a nephew of King Salman, is in intensive care, according to doctors at the King Faisal Specialist Hospital, who spoke to the New York Times. And by the way, that hospital is an elite institution where the royals are cared for. You and I cannot get into that hospital. We're not in the big club. <laughs> well, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So all those princes with the towel wrapped around uh, and their swords they swing around, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're, they're just as susceptible to the poor guy out downtown Riyadh to it, uh, pushing a cart. Hey, like, Mother I'll, Nature doesn't give a damn. I'll be controversial. I'll repeat what I said on our official Facebook page. Hopefully some of these bloodthirsty murderers over there might go away because of this disease. Yeah. yeah. And that's just exactly what they are. Jamal Khashoggi. Yeah. Just, if you don't agree with me, I'll just say two words. Jamal Khashoggi. The Saudi government is nothing but a bunch of bloodthirsty killers. Period. Full stop. Mm -hmm. And, folks, if you ever get a chance to go to Washington, D.C., make sure you drive by the full block embassy for the kingdom, mm -hmm. the empire, Saudi Arabia. Take, take a look at it. Yeah. By the way, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is widely considered the true power, he's holed up with ministers at a property on the Red Sea coast. King Salman, who's 84 years old, is self-isolating at an island palace near the city of Jeddah on the country's Red Sea coast. So they're scared. They're trying to hide from this. Well, this yeah. that ain't gonna, it ain't going to help them. I got bad news for them because I just saw a story right before we started recording today that there is a tribe in the Amazon just reported their first case of coronavirus. A very isolated tribe has it. That's where I was going to go. I guess that's out too. Yeah. The, I'll it's, the side. It's going to get you. They even have a tiger in the Bronx Zoo now. Yeah, we haven't talked about that yet. They think a tiger at the Bronx Zoo, they think it's actually more than one. They've only tested one of them. Got the virus from a zoo handler who had the coronavirus and was asymptomatic. They're well, like, hey, these tigers are coughing and running eyes. And tell you what, just just for shits and giggles, we'll test it for coronavirus. 
And then when it came back, they're like, "Uh oh, we didn't expect this." Yeah, you know what's scary when you told that story is that somehow, somehow they got it. Somehow a tribe out in the middle of the wilderness got it. Mm-hmm. But you don't know how. But just somehow, then and folks, we're completely unscripted. We we have not rehearsed the show. This is just me talking to my very good progressive friend. That's about a hundred miles or uh, fifty miles away. Okay, mm-hmm. so Darren, I'm going to ask you: Do you see Bill Riley's statement that hey, these people are going to die anyway? Most of them. Right? Yes, I did. What are we looking at? Seventeen thousand people. Yeah, Bill. I, 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 Bill the clown. I, I'm out of words. Bill the clown. Yeah, I well, saw it and I I could not read it because. I would get angry, I would find Bill O'Reilly, and I would punch him in the face, let him send Fox Security after me. <laughs> Which he has threatened to do to people in the past, by the way. I wonder how much clout he's got over there, Fox Propaganda Channel, now that he's off their network. Now, would he include Rush Limbaugh in that group? He's going to die anyway. Oh, God, Rush Limbaugh. Yeah, Rush made some comments, too. I can't, Jack, I can't. All right, that's all right. Do I? Do I? I guess I really need to play the Rush Limbaugh clip that I did, the parody. Let me see if I can find that real quick here. If I can type it in, I'm laughing so hard that it's uh, killing me here. Yeah, here's here's the parody that I talk about. I'm Rush Limbaugh, the doctor shopping, pill popping, draft ducking, prostitute fucking, loud mouth piece of. Shit. With a golden microphone. (laughs) I needed that. I haven't played that in a long, long time. We did need that. Oh, my God. Put Bill Riley right there with him. I mean, really. Bill the Clown, as Keith Olbermann used to call him. Where's Keith Olbermann? We need Keith around. Yeah. Well, I just want to add one thing before we go off talking about the coronavirus. Did you see the CNN town hall meeting with medical officials. They have it every Thursday. Last night was noteworthy because a guy named uh, Redfield, I'm not sure of his uh, first name, he's the new CDC director. Mm -hmm. And I did some research on this guy. I couldn't believe it. You know, he's he's saying, they're they're saying, the pundits are saying, this is Trump's new coronavirus whisper, you know, like the uh, horse and dog whisper. This is the new whisper. Uh, This guy's been hiding He's just reappeared. Wednesday was his first appearance this week on Trump's uh, carnival stage uh, daily. Wow. And, and now last night he was the mainline guy in this uh, this town hall. Redfield is a longtime staunch conservative. I get this. He's the head of the CDC, right? Mm-hmm. He's a Christian scientist. Oh, and brother. He's <laughs> the CDC. I mean, it's bad enough to see Kushner being put in charge of anything medically, right? Any type of health. Does that mean association between the two? Does that mean that the CDC now stands for Christian Disease Control? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) We're in trouble, man. Oh, man, are we ever. Are we ever, Darren Gibson. We have been in trouble since 2018. I'm going to go back here. This is an article that was written by Lauren Weber, on May 9th, 2018, for the Huffington Post. Let me read a little bit of this here. If you want to know how this all started, you need to go back to May 2018. Rear Admiral Tim Ziemer, the head of global health security on the White House's National Security Council, left the Trump administration on Tuesday. The news was announced one day after an Ebola outbreak was declared in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The departure comes amid a reshuffling of the National Security Council under newly named National Security Advisor John Bolton, which includes a change in organizational structure that eliminates the office Zemer led. Zemer staff has been placed under other NSC departments. Zemer, who has been described as one of the most quietly effective leaders in public health, was widely lauded in the global health community for his work on the president's malaria initiative, which helped save 6 million lives before joining this administration. This is the guy that was let go when Trump, probably under the advice of Bolton, if this HuffPost 
article is correct, got rid of the pandemic council that Obama put in place. Yeah. Right yeah. there it is in black and white, folks. You don't have to go to Snopes. You don't have to go to PolitiFact and fact check it. Right there is in black and white, people. Yep. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Here's what you want. You want something that will scare the crap out of you folks? This is an article written by Charles Davis for Business Insider. If this doesn't oh, scare you Great. nothing well, listen to this. U.S. doctors and public health experts are asking states to hand over their death penalty drugs to save lives. In an April 9th letter to directors of state prisons obtained by the Marshall Project's Carrie Blakinger, the medical experts said, quote, the medicines your states are currently holding for use in lethal injection executions are in short supply and desperately needed to treat patients suffering from COVID-19, end of quote. One of those drugs is a paralytic. They use that so they can put you on a ventilator because when they try to shove a tube down your throat and into your lungs, you're going to fight it. So yeah, they yes. knock you out before they do it. They sedate you. So isn't that something? Then we now have to go to the states that do lethal injections and say, here, you need to fork those drugs over so that we can use them to treat people that are going to be put on ventilators. You're right. It does scare the crap out of you. Did you ever think that we would ever get to that point in this country? I passed that statement months ago. I mean, in all seriousness, I never, I mean, I can think back when I was a young man and I foresaw the future and you put some kind of a map in front of yourself. I never saw this destination, nowhere near it. Yeah. Never thought I'd be doing this when I was 70 years of age. Yep. And uh, I tell you what, Jack, before we go, we have some other articles we did not get a chance to get to that are posted on our official Facebook page. We have this one from Business Insider. This is by Sinead Baker. Headline reads, Denmark rushed to lock down before almost every other country. Now its response is so far ahead that it's starting to remove restrictions. And then, Jack, you've posted an article from the National Education Association, they're asking for your help to stop Betsy DeVos from using the coronavirus crisis to push school privatization vouchers. And then two other stories we have. New York Times Magazine, John Ismay, writing on April 5th, headline reads, Navy captain removed from carrier test positive for COVID-19. And then we have the follow-up from CNN Jim Sciuto, Barbara Starr, Zachary Cohen, and Ryan Brown writing this. Acting Secretary of the Navy resigns after calling ousted aircraft carrier captain stupid. So we didn't get a chance to get to those articles, but they will be up on our official Facebook page. Go to facebook.com forward slash Southpaw's radio show to find those. And with that, we yes, and with that, we are out of time for this week. We'll be back next week. I'm Darren Gibson. I'm Jack Prince. For our announcer, Kristen Cook, please support independent media and the First Amendment. And remember, you're not in the big club. The stations that carry Southpaws do not necessarily share the opinions expressed on the show. Southpaws is protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and is copyrighted by Big D Entertainment. All rights reserved.